G'day. Welcome back. We don't rise to the occasion. We don't rise to the occasion. We sink to the level of our training. You might have heard this said in many different kinds of ways. How we do one thing is how we do everything. That's another way of saying we sink to the level of our training. When you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, you end up doing what you always normally do without thinking about it. That's another way of saying we don't rise to the occasion. We sink to the level of training. What I'm about to share with you in this episode, my friend, has no good or bad connotations. It just is. We can rise to the occasion. I'm asking you to choose not to. Why? Because as you'll learn, too much pressure for too long causes really big problems like burnout, exhaustion, anxiety, depression, other mental health issues, diabetes, heart disease, all kinds of problems. And the reason why we have to rise to the occasion instead of sinking to the level of our training is often because of lack of preparation. Now, I know this might sound really weird. If you've followed me for a while, you know I'm a wing it kind of a gal. But in a way, I'm kind of not as well. And I really value practicing performing under pressure more so than needing to have my notes in order, if you know what I mean. So I was having a conversation with a client and they are an incredibly brave human being, someone I love coaching because the type of person who, like me, sometimes you just need to burn your bridges. Sometimes in order to get going and make it happen, you need to actually shut everything off, quit your job, sell your house, go all in. That's the way. I love people like this. It's not for everyone and it's not for every certain situation. However, some circumstances, that's the way you get going. Now, it's often romanticized and it's spoken about really positively and people talk about like, oh, you know, I just couldn't wait to quit my job and do it. I just went all in. And what we often don't hear is the dark side of that, the private feeling of when's it going to work and how long do I have to put up with this for? And it's like really uncomfortable. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the pieces that we don't often see, why they exist, how to stop and prevent that from actually happening, um, and some ways you can put yourself in situations so that you do actually learn to be calm under pressure. So have you ever like sung in the shower and you sound freaking amazing and the tiles create just the right acoustics and because it's all dark and no one's really listening, you can fully belt out the song and you might not hit the note exactly quite perfectly, but it's sounds freaking awesome. And because no one's listening, you just go even harder and you sit, your shower singing sounds amazing. But then you get invited to karaoke and your boss is there and it's not dark and you've got to get the words right. And you're thinking about it so much that nothing comes out. Maybe you've had a similar kind of circumstance. That's what I'm referring to, right? Another time I can think of is, you know, I was training for a world title once And when we would train, we would do like thousands of punches every night, just punches on punches on punches on punches. And in the training dojo, no one's really watching. No one cares if you get the punch like perfect. If you land it perfectly every single time, no one cares. You've got a million more punches to do. But when I flew to England, I had three minutes. Every punch had to land. They all had to be perfect. There were people screaming at me and there were people I loved watching. I wanted to impress them and there were judges judging how quickly we did it. And there was a timer and whistles and everything going on. I remember getting off and saying, oh my God, I could not land a punch. My body was full of adrenaline. So this is the kind of thing that happens when the safety net gets taken away. Adrenaline increases, pressure increases. I don't know about you, but when the pressure is higher for me, my creativity is lower. My relaxation is lower naturally. Sometimes I make more decisions from a place of panic or stress or fear rather than being relaxed, assuming the outcome is going to be positive. You know, when the safety net gets taken away, gravity changes. That's what I'm saying. And the way I would describe gravity in this circumstance, it's the unseen factors that impact the result directly or indirectly that you don't necessarily consider. So for example, if you have a business and you're growing it on the side. So you have a full-time job, you have a cushy income, your partner is also working and there's money coming in and you're safe and your house is paid for and all that jazz. And then you decide to change those circumstances, run the same business, but all of a sudden you've sold your house, you've quit your job, your partner's quit their job, you're traveling full-time and you are the sole income earner of the family. Gravity has just changed. Same business, same skills, same incredible human, same everything, but gravity is different. That can impact us 
in ways that we can't really predict or understand. I love talking about this with clients because so often when I get to speak to them, they've already made the leap. Gravity has already changed. So I'll talk to you about what will happen if you're in that situation too. Gravity's already changed. But first I'm going to talk about how to avoid the situation in the first place where gravity changing really affects you. So when gravity changes, the basic things feel harder for some reason. I used to have a client who was working for a design studio and he had to come up with something like 25 new designs every single day for the business. He was a graphic designer. It was a a very, very well-known surf brand company, 25 designs every single day. And very, very difficult to do, potentially easier in the beginning, but over time when the pressure is exactly the same over time, creativity kind of starts to wane and doesn't feel so fun anymore. And then as you can imagine, long-term, it just doesn't, the joy gets sucked out of that creativity. I don't know if you've ever tried to create under pressure. You might be able to do it once or twice, but over time, you know, having that pressure, we start to think about, is this going to make money? Is this going to work? Are people going to like it? Is it going to have the results and impact? I speak to people who have businesses all the time. They write podcasts instead of just, you know, expressing what they want to express. It's like, Oh, how many downloads did that get? Did it work? Social media is the same deal. Which of those photos actually worked? And we can start to get caught up in some of their basics. They start to feel harder because we're putting pressure on them. That's what I mean by gravity changes and the basic things feel harder. You see it all the time in other places as well. I remember when my dad told me this, he used to tell this story all the time about when he was a builder and he worked on a job site. My dad had a building company and he quit university when he was quite young, early into the piece and decided to get his builder's license the old school way back in the day by building a house with another builder. Now he had a lot of practical and experiential knowledge. And what he used to notice was people would finish their university degree in building and have no practical knowledge. And then they'd come onto the job site thinking that they knew everything that they needed to know, but it was all theory. And so they came into a challenge because someone would say, hey, can you go down to the hardware store and get this part for a tool? Forget it. They didn't know what they were talking about. The logistics of dealing with problems that were unexpected when the building didn't go 100% right or the timing was affected. Maybe there was something, problems underground or something burst or something, you know, wasn't found by council, they discovered it later. Things underneath the house that blew the budget and time constraints out and the client gets really upset. They didn't know what to do or say because they hadn't had the practical experience before. When you think about it, you know, owning a hammer and watching some YouTube videos about how to build a house and then reading a book on how to build a house, you might have all the right tools and know what to do and be tracking how to do it properly. But that's not what happens when you build a house. What happens when you build a house is at every stage, there are so many factors that can impact you. There can be council changes. There can be weather impacts. There can be law changes. There can be problems with neighbors. There can be delays with council. There can be client issues. That's not building a house. The whole thing is building a house. And so we have to consider that gravity inside of when we talk about doing the actual thing. So when I was a martial artist, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but we used to train from chaos, meaning we'd train with three people beating us up and having to get out of it or being three points down, world championships is at risk and we had 30 seconds left on the clock. I mentioned this in the last episode and that was how we started to change gravity. I'll talk more about that later in the episode. So what do we do? How do we actually impact when gravity changes? How can we avoid the massive increase of stress really quickly and do our very best to achieve the same results under more high pressure circumstances. Well, two things, I'm going to give you lots of examples. The first one is reframe pressure. Studies show us that when a kid goes into an exam prepared, that it might be a challenge, like pre-framed from the teacher. This might be a challenge, but then they say, but challenge makes us grow faster. It helps us get better. It helps us be stronger. That child will perform better. We are so often as adults trying to avoid risk. We are really great at what we do, but we don't do anything outside of that because we don't want to experience pressure. We don't want to be wrong. We don't want to look silly. We don't want to fail. Pressure is not a bad thing. Pressure creates diamonds. It's too much pressure for too long. That's what causes the problems. A little bit of pressure fortifies us in resilience. It makes us cope better with life with problems, with stress, with ongoing stress, it actually helps us remain more calm because we don't get swayed and sweat the small stuff. Pressure is freaking awesome. So 
reframe pressure, become friends with it, use it as an ally and a tool for peak performance. Now, here's how you do that. You practice pressure environments as often as possible. So set yourself up for your own version of success by giving yourself the gift of not going into a stressful situation and having that be the very first time you've ever experienced anything like it. That's horrible, right? We want to avoid that at all costs. Now, it might sound crazy to put yourself in a high pressure environment on purpose, but I guarantee you, you do it on purpose. It's so different to when it happens by accident. Now, true, some pressure circumstances we just can't avoid. It happens, we get thrown in the deep end. That's a whole other conversation, right? But most things can be smoothed out if we have bothered to put ourselves in a real pressure circumstance up front, front loaded it intentionally on purpose. Years ago, I used to attend these workshops with a company called Frontier Trainings and I'll link Clinton Swain. He's the owner of the company. I'll link Clinton's website in the show notes for you. We would go there and spend a week or more at a time staying in this scout camp in the bush and playing experiential games from early in the morning until really late at night. And we'd have costumes and lights, props, soundtracks, sound effects, and over a hundred different characters like running the games, all simulating different circumstances where we would need to apply high pressure insights to business lessons, to sporting lessons, to body lessons in the game. These games were high pressure. Time just went really quickly. We had to work in teams, different personalities. They cope with stress and pressure really differently. And there were so many layers of like pressure and competition and challenge and testing and reward all going on at once. We're just forced to get out of our heads and just play. And how we played in that game was typically how we played in life. So there were so many tears and breakdowns, but there were also huge breakthroughs. How we showed up in that room was so closely simulated to how we play in real life. And after the games, we would have incredible insights. We'd reflect on how we showed up, what really worked, what really frustrated us, and also what we do next time. And because of the games, they were so impactful and real, those lessons stuck. It was so intense. It's definitely not for everyone, but it was life-changing. And what it was, was simulating pressure environments as often as possible before needing to, like intentionally and on purpose, where the result wasn't going to be terrible off the back so that when you get into that circumstance, you know what to do. Years on, I still come back to the insights and distinctions I've learned under those high stakes, high pressure circumstances, like events like that, or like in my martial arts training, performing under pressure in world titles. And I use them as a filter to make decisions today. I guarantee you that you, my dear friend, my dear listener, you have circumstances where you've created some kind of success in the past. It doesn't have to have anything to do with what you're doing today, but think about past things you've competed in or performed in or really, really enjoyed and done for a long time or a skill that you have mastered. There are probably insights and distinctions and ways that you did that and things that you applied in that circumstance that would really help you in other areas of life. When you can simulate pressure, it makes your life easier and more calm knowing that you're trained to think under pressure, not just think when there's no pressure and you can't think when there is. Does that make sense? Beep, pause. (laughs) G'day. Before we go any further in today's episode, I'm giving you a heads up that my online NLP certification immersive Be Your Own Coach for next year's cohort 2023 is open right now. This is a six-month coaching and transformation immersion with me as your coach and teacher, and it's open to anyone who is ready to learn the best-kept secret of high performance and healing. It's a coaching certification, meaning you'll walk out at the end with the skills not only to use on yourself, but if you want to, other people as well. This is the foundational skill set that I still use today in my coaching every single day, as well as this is how I've grown my business. So maybe you'd want to use that on your clients. Maybe though it's family members, kids, friends, colleagues, or you can simply just treat it as your next personal development experience. It will change your life as it has mine. 
go to hayleycar.tv forward slash NLP dash training. I'll pop the link in the show notes so you can join me. The doors are open now. They will close soon. And there are some incredible bonuses for jumping in early. Okay, back to the episode. So how do we do this at home? And more importantly, why should I bother? I've got too much to do already, Hayley Carr. Okay, well, both of those questions can be answered in one sentence, pretty much, because anything, even chores, can be turned into an exercise. And it's so fun to feel the stretch of growth knowing that you are equipped to handle things. Confidence feels great. It also makes it so much easier when the pressure is high. So I've got three ways that you can do this. The first one is simulate the real thing. I'll give you heaps of examples, right? So karaoke is kind of like a performance, but you've got a screen in front of you and everyone kind of knows that it's not designed to be high pressure. But if you put yourself in smaller, less high stakes circumstances in a training ground where you can sort of practice playing in a band, it doesn't really matter if you stuff it up a little bit. It's so much easier to move on to the real thing. Going from singing in the shower where you've got the gravity of privacy, you've got the gravity of like fantastic tiling acoustics and you've got, you know, it doesn't matter if you, if you go because you forget the words, it doesn't matter going from that to like singing on stage and you don't have a script in front of you, you know what you're doing too much pressure too soon. You know what I mean? Like it's one thing to study for your exams at night after dinner with your shoes off at home and a nice beverage. It's another to practice that same study at the exact time of day your exam is going to be under the same circumstances, like with a timer. Your uniform, for example, maybe your shoes are really hot and uncomfortable. Wear them when you study. Because one thing we know for sure is that when gravity changes, the more you can have similar circumstances to your training, the easier it is to just slip back into automatic mode. In the ring, for example, I mentioned this before, we used to train. So not just like do heaps of punches, but 30 seconds on the clock, you are three points down and the world title is on the clock. Our opponent's only job was to prevent us from getting any point. So their whole motivation was to just stop you from being out of touch and they could run around the ring if they want to. Our job was you have 30 seconds to get three whole points. That was so hard, but that's what we trained for for weeks on end. And I was so grateful because one day I was in that situation and I needed to make a comeback and I was able to do it purely because I trained from it. I didn't have to think about it, didn't have to stress about it. I didn't overthink about the fact of what everything that was at stake. I went straight into automatic training mode. So you can put timelines on things as well that don't usually have timelines. For example, you might, you know, have a savings goal and you know that if you just keep showing up to work and you pay yourself the same amount over time, you will have a certain amount of money in your savings. Imagine giving yourself instead one week to make your next $100,000 or your next $10,000 or $1,000 or whatever, right? Make it scary, make it exciting, make it a stretch. And watch what happens when you practice doing things quickly. Now, side note, that does not mean you become a sleazy high pressure salesperson. There are other ways to do that. I know I don't need to say that, but it will mean that if you ever happen to find yourself needing to get real creative really quickly, you've done it before and you're not doing it for the first time, right? Last year in my business, I said to my team, I really want to practice launching at least once a month. I don't want us to be treating our launches like we're going to improve next time, but there's such a vast amount of distance and time between our launches that every time is more practice. Every time is more practice. But I thought, how cool would it be if we have so much practice at that, the launching piece, that's not a difficult thing when it comes to launch time. You know, we turn that mountain into a molehill. So I told them I wanted to practice launching at least once a month. My God, it was such a stretch for us. In the end, like we didn't love it. (laughs) Well, I shouldn't say we didn't love it. I did love it. I loved the aliveness of it. I loved the pressure. I loved that we were practicing, but I knew it's not a sustainable way to run a business over time. Anyway, now we know if we ever have a great idea or we need to implement an opportunity really quickly for some reason, we have incredible systems and strategies in the back end of my business to make really big things happen within days. So that's an example of simulating the real thing without the real pressure. The second example of this is think about all the potential ways that how you're doing things now, your current strategy could actually go wrong or the ways it used to work, the ways it was always right, and 
simulate that, simulate that experience and see what you can do. I'll give you an example. I used to practice a non-contact style of martial arts where every time we'd fight, you'd start behind the line. It was like, ready, set, go, right? And I was worried that I'd never actually be able to defend myself in real life because if someone tried to punch me or there was a bad guy, I'd be like, wait, stop, let's get behind the line, ready, set, go. That's not ideal. That's not how it happens. So in our um, training, we would practice instead with three people like on top of us and we were in a very compromised position. You know, you'd be like bent over or on the ground and one person be kicking you and the other person be holding your arms back and another person have you in a headlock. And we would train to create order from chaos instead. That's something that could go wrong. Instead of, you know, going, stop, I'm not ready, we would say, okay, go. And you had to get yourself out of that circumstance first and then into the position where you felt comfortable to ground yourself and actually fight. Also, every now and again, put gear on and practice not pulling our punches so that we didn't just always train pulling our punches and then get into a real situation and be like, hey, like not actually touch anyone. Now, my client couldn't do that simulation of what could go wrong in her circumstance. And this is for you if you're in the same situation, like gravity has already taken impact. I've already taken the leap. I'm already there. This is when I love coaching people, by the way, in these circumstances. Safety net's already been removed. Pressure is high, high stakes too. And it was contributing to a shift in energy for my client. What I asked them to do instead was simulate the safety net that they already knew and felt and had experienced before as much as possible. Now, what's weird about that, what's weird about this thing is when we simulate, we're using imagination. So it works both ways. You can imagine things to go wrong and and simulate that to increase the pressure. But when the pressure is high, you can also simulate the pressure being gone and practice acting from that place. It will feel bonkers at first because your reality script is saying, don't ignore this. Don't ignore this. This is really happening. No, no, no. It's not safe. But when you're in a high pressure circumstance, when we're acting from a place of, you know, fear and stress and panic, as I mentioned, it happens to all of us. It's not ideal, right? So whatever we can do to bring the mountain down to a molehill, to smooth things out, to make it feel like, even though it's not necessarily there coming from that place, we behave very, very, very differently. And it actually erases problems so much faster. It's really hard, by the way, as well. My client has done this so incredibly well, but whatever we have to do, right? So even if the circumstances were really, really bad and there's only a tiny chance of success, that's all we have to focus on. I remember when years ago, I was in a relationship with a man who had terminal cancer. He was getting treatment and I was just mentally like not coping. So I was speaking to my doctor. I was crying. I was like, I'm so stressed. You know, what if he doesn't survive? What What's going to happen? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to us? What, you know, all, all of the logistics. I was just a mess. And my doctor said to me, Haley, even if he only had a 1% chance of survival, that's all you need to focus on because everything else we don't know. We can't control it. But if you focus on all the things that could go wrong, you're going to feel crap. And if you focus on what could go right, you're going to feel a bit better. So focus on it working and just focus on that. And honestly, it was just the best thing that a doctor could have told me at that time because there was really nothing else I could do. So what we focus on really does expand. What we focus on really does impact the way that we feel. How we feel impacts the way that we talk to ourselves, make decisions, take actions, and so on. So the first two have been simulate the real thing. Think about the ways it could go right or wrong and simulate that. And the third one is seek out uncomfortable situations and experiences that will grow you as a human. So this is probably the easiest one to apply and remember for the rest of your life. If something feels scary and exciting at the same time, if it terrifies you and it turns you on, do it. If you hate speaking in public, join Toastmasters. If you hate talking to people, you're an introvert, go and take a class and chat to the person beside you or go on a holiday to a foreign country on your own, maybe on a tour, maybe not, so that you're forced to make friends. If you hate doing anything alone, you you need to be with people all the time, go to the movies alone, go traveling alone. Put your hand up when you're usually used to holding back and leaving space for everyone else. Ask questions when you usually keep quiet. Be quiet when you usually take up space. You know, get uncomfortable. It will increase your range and stop you from being reactive and rather instead become proactive or responsive 
to challenges. So the more you can increase your capacity for discomfort and the longer you can hold that capacity for discomfort, the chances of success in whatever it is that you're doing, they increase and increase and increase. Put yourself in a mentorship that scares you, that stretches you, that even makes you feel like you're not ready yet, or maybe brings up those imposter syndrome feelings I talked about in the last episode. Watch what happens in a short space of time. So a personal strategy of mine is if it terrifies me and turns me on, I will do it. It will help you feel calm. It will help you feel confident. It will help you feel resilient. Okay. Drilling down. Here's the short of it. We don't rise to the occasion. We can, but it's unsustainable. We sink to the level of our training. That's what super freaks do. If you want to continue to improve your life, your income, your career, your happiness, your health sustainably for the rest of your life, know this intentional discomfort is the way to do it. If it's scary, but you're excited, do it. I hope this has been helpful for you today, my friend. Get to the training ground now. Ask yourself, "Hmm, what feels scary? What feels like an edge? Where am I holding back? Where do I become afraid and stressed and reactive and angry when the pressure is high? How can I simulate that experience to build resilience and training around it? What could go wrong? What goes right? How can I simulate that? Where can I get uncomfortable today? It will be awkward at first. Over the long term, your capacity will be vastly different. Remember, everything you want is so much closer than you think. So stay curious, stay open. I'll see you soon.